Good morning, everyone. Um, do me a favor, turn to the person next to you and say, you're going to learn something today. Now turn back to them and say, and it's about time. <laughs> Are you comfortable today? The temperature of the room is pretty comfortable, right? The lighting is nice. The seats and the tables are arranged for your comfort, right? You feel safe. You feel secure. That's climate. And the odd thing about climate is if you go out into the reception area, guess what you find there, too? Climate. You go into the registration area, what's there? Climate. You go into the parking deck, what do you find there? Climate. You get in your car, there's climate in your car. You go to a store, there's climate. You go to a Kroger or a Chick-fil-A or a Publix, why do you go there? There are stores that you actually pass by to get to a store that you like. There are restaurants. Look at the number of restaurants you pass by to get to the restaurant that you choose. Why do you choose that restaurant? Is the food really that good? The menu, that variety? You choose those. You make those selections primarily because you feel comfortable. You feel comfortable in that climate. When you go to a Kroger anywhere in Georgia or go to a Chick-fil-A anywhere in the southeast, what do you expect? You're going to feel safe. You're going to feel secure. You expect it to be clean. You expect it to be treated with respect. You expect to go in the bathroom. It's going to be clean, right? It doesn't matter where the Chick-fil-A is, right? Why don't we have the same expectation for every school in Georgia? Businesses have turned their companies around. The CEOs will tell you every time, what did they change first? They changed the climate. But for some reason, we don't have that same discussion about schools. Let me ask you to do something else. Go into your memory palace for just a moment and think about your own experience in school. If you have to close your eyes to do that, fine. Go into your memory palace. We all have a memory palace. That's where we keep our memories. Go down that long hallway. The rooms are labeled with your memories. Open the door, it says school. And think about your own experience for just a moment. Forget you're in the room. Think about your own experience in school. Go down that memory. Go into that memory palace. Go into that room. Now, for a lot of you, that memory was very positive. You really enjoyed school. But for some of us going into that room, that's a pretty dark place to go. But all these years later, all these years later, you have a, almost a visceral response to your memory of school, almost a galvanic response when you think about school. But when you think about your own experience, ladies and gentlemen, in school, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about math and science and social studies? Your memory is school climate. That's how powerful it is. How many of you think it's time for Georgia to have a goal for every school in Georgia to have a positive school climate? A shout out. Do you think it's time in Georgia for every school in Georgia to have a positive school climate? Is that a goal? Should that be a goal? With all due respect, I think you're wrong. Why can't it be an expectation? I don't know about you. I'm frankly, I'm tired of goals. I'm ready to move to expectations. Do you think Delta Airlines has a goal for every plane to land safely? <laughs> Put me on that expectation plane, not the goal plane. <laughs> it's time for us to move up and step up because I tell you what, in a school setting or in your own organization, there's leadership change. The governor's office, every place we work with, 
There's leadership change. You know what happens when the leadership changes? The goals change. New strategic plan. The goals change. When something becomes an expectation, does it change that easily? No, we expect it to happen. We don't care who the leader is. We have expectations, and the leader comes to the expectation, not the other way around. Many, many, many years ago, I was a school psychologist in a very large school system. We had over 150 schools and over 110,000 students. And my job was to be what they called the mental health crisis responder, which meant if a student had a mental health crisis like suicide ideation or maybe even a psychotic break, I would get called to the school. And I got one of those calls one day, and I went to a school I had not been to before. And I drove up to the school, and I noticed the grass had not been cut. The hedges had grown, overgrown the front windows of the school. When I went through the front door, the front door was propped open and held open by a rock. Five steps into the building, I can smell the bathroom. The hallways were dirty, litter everywhere. You could hear shouting in the hallway. You could hear shouting in the classroom. So I'm ushered into the counseling office, and the counselor met me there, and so we have this young girl we think uh, is in trouble, and we need for you to, to work with her. So they took me into the counseling conference room, and there was one table in there. And as I walked in, the table was in front of me, and sitting on the other side of the table was a young girl with her head down on the table, about 15 years old. Her hair was matted, her clothes were unkept, she had her head on the table, and she did not bother to look up when we entered the room. Now sometimes as adults, we talk too much. There's sometimes when we just really need to listen there are times when we need to let our children come to us instead of us talking to them all the time and not listening. That just felt like a time where I just needed to be quiet and let her come to me. With her head down like that, I didn't think there was anything I could say that would be relevant to her. She was in so much pain. So I pulled up the chair and sat right across from her and you know how uncomfortable silence is? It's uncomfortable. In a situation like that, it was very uncomfortable. But I sat there for a long time because it just felt like the right thing to do. Eventually, and it, it did take a while, but eventually she lifted her head up. And ladies and gentlemen, I saw the most mournful, saddest eyes I have ever seen. All these years later, I can still vi visualize it now, even now. <clears throat> Tears running down her face, unkept appearance, but that look in her eyes, it, it was a look of desperation. It was a look, there's no hope. It was the most desperate set of eyes I've ever seen. But she looked up at me, and I, I still didn't say anything. And guess what she said to me? None of you would ever guess what she said to me. She said in the saddest tone you can imagine, she said, do you believe in unicorns? And I'm telling you folks, nothing in graduate school or an internship will <laughs> prepare you for that moment. <laughs> and I knew that that was a very critical moment for her. I was terrified to say the wrong thing. This was a very poignant moment for her. I was terrified to say the wrong thing. Nothing trained me for that. So I said to her the only thing I could say to her, which came straight from my heart, was, yes, sweetheart, I believe in unicorns. That was a turning point for her because we connected. That moment... We connected. 
And to make a very long story short, we did get her the help she needed. She had to be institutionalized for a while, and we got the family the help that they needed. And once we took care of that situation, I went to the superintendent's office. We had a relatively new superintendent at that time. He didn't really know me, and I really didn't know him. But I said to the superintendent, I said, would you visit a school with me, please? Now, this is a 100,000 student school system, 150 schools. This is a very busy superintendent. He didn't know me. He said, okay, let's go. We got in the car, and I didn't want to mention anything about where we were going. And you know, he didn't ask. He, talk, he asked questions about me and my family and my life, and we had just that type of exchange. We get to the school, I pull into the parking lot. Again, there's no discussion. We got out of the car, went into school. He went about halfway down the main hallway there, and he turned to me and he said, I know why we're here. I'm going to take care of this. Two years ago, I went into my office pretty early, and I was checking my emails. And I saw an email address I didn't recognize, and the subject line was very interesting. In the subject line, guess what was there? Do you believe in unicorns? 27 years later, she contacted me and wanted to meet. So we met for lunch. We talked a long time. She has three children. She finished high school. She is a certified medical assistant. She has a good job in a doctor's office, has been in that doctor's office for over 15 years. We talked a long time. We talked about her life and what happened. But what was the strongest message to me, ladies and gentlemen, guess what she talked about the most? You may be surprised. What did she talk about the most during the time we had together? 27 years later. She said, Gary, when I went back to school, the grass was cut. The hallways were clean. The restroom I avoided because it was filthy was clean. The teachers engaged in the class conversation with students. The counselor even came by the the classroom occasionally to ask if I was doing okay. The adults seemed to be getting along with each other. She went on and on and on. She got involved in school activities because she was asked to, she was encouraged to. 27 years later, ladies and gentlemen, she's talking about what? School climate. That's how powerful it is. 27 years later, she wanted to talk about school climate more than anything else we talked about. So ladies and gentlemen, I don't know a whole lot, but I know three things. Number one, school climate matters. Number two, we can do something about it. All of us can do something about it. We can improve school climate. And number three, I believe in unicorns. Thank you.